Hello, PodB students. Uh, today we are going to be talking about market structures. Um, chapter 7 talks about market structures and market failures. So we've just finished talking about supply and demand. Um, we know that a market is any place where goods and services are exchanged between buyers and sellers. Remember our Bort market activity. So this chapter is going to look at what happens when markets don't work perfectly. So we start off with the beginning of uh, chapter 7 looking at various different market structures. So um, an economist looks at markets but based on how competitive are they um, and basically they have created different market structures. So when we're talking about market structures it's talking about the way that a uh, market is organized and it's they look primarily at the level or the degree of competition amongst producers. So economists define market structure according to four different characteristics. So in this chapter you're going to be looking for, for every market structure that we discuss, you're looking for these four characteristics that are listed on this slide. So in order to determine the amount of competition amongst these different producers, we're going to look at the number of producers in that market, the similarity of the products that they create, the ease of entry, so how easy is it to get into that market or to create a business in that market, and then how much control do producers have over prices? So to give you just a little bit more information about each of those four characteristics, by number of producers we mean what is the amount of competition, okay? So the number of producers is going to determine the amount of competition. The more producers there are in the market, the more competition there is or the more competitive that market is. So if you have a lot of producers making the same thing, that's a lot of competition. If you have only one company that produces something, like they are the only ones that make this product, that's not a lot of competition. So that's going to determine that market structure is how many producers are there. Uh, similarity of products, the more similar the product is, the more competition it is. If everybody's making the same thing, as a consumer, think about it, you've got a lot of different choices. You can go to a variety of different fast food locations to pick out the type of food that you want to eat. Or we could even look at um, a specific type of fast food. There's a lot of burger places that in the fast food market. They're all creating a similar product. So there's a lot of competition there. Uh, it's giving consumers a lot of choice. By ease of entry, we're looking at the measurement of how easy is it to start a new business in that market. So markets that are easy to enter are going to have more producers and therefore be more competitive. And then the last one is control over prices. When we're talking about control over prices, we're talking about how much power does the producer have? So what's the ability to influence prices? Um, we call that market power. So the more competitive a market is, the less market power that that producer has. So again, if you've got a market where there's a lot of competitors, go back to that fast food example. We've got a whole bunch of burger places in the fast food market. They all need to have relatively similar prices. Uh, they don't have as much market power as if they were the only producer. If McDonald's was the only place that made fast food burgers, they'd have complete control over that market and they could set the price at whatever they wanted. The more competitors you have, the less control over prices you have because you've got to be competitive. Your consumers are going to go somewhere else if your prices are too high. So when we talk about market structures, we can look at them or think of them as a spectrum. And we're going to talk about all four of these market structures coming up in this chapter. We're going to start today with perfect competition. Um, and then you're going to look at monopolistic competition, oligopolies, and monopolies. So when we look at this spectrum here, you can see that on this end of the spectrum, perfect competition is the most competition. Okay? You have the highest number of producers. Um, you have the most control over, or excuse me, the least control over prices uh, because you've got all those competitors in the market. As you move in this direction down the spectrum, um, you've got less competition. If you are a monopoly, you are the only producer of that product. You have complete control over prices. It's going to be really hard to enter that market. Um, and, and so forth. So we're going to talk about each of these four structures and we're going to look at those four characteristics for each structure.
So chapter seven talks, uh, starts with perfect competition. Um, perfect competition is the most competitive market structure. Uh, in a perfectly competitive market, there's a large number of firms producing basically the same product. Okay. All goods and services are sold at equilibrium price uh, or the price is set by the market when that quantity supplied and quantity demanded is in balance. So think back to your supply and demand graphs and think about what equilibrium looks like. That perfect kind of happy medium where consumers and producers are happy. So economists consider perfect competition to be the most efficient market structure in terms of allocating resources to the people that value them the most because that quantity supplied and quantity demand meets. So although there's a lot of markets that are highly competitive, perfect competition is, is relatively rare. Um, really, as we look at this chapter, as you read, keep in mind that the models that we're going to talk about aren't always really easy to identify in an actual economy. These are theoretical um, definitions of these four structures. Sometimes a market is going to have mixed features. So don't get confused by that. Just kind of we want you to get a solid understanding of what are the four structures of markets and then what or how do each of the market structures meet those four characteristics that we talked about the number of producers, the similarity of the product, the ease of entry, and the control over prices. So um, in that capacity, when we're talking about perfect competition, um, again, it's going to, to meet that criteria. So let's look, take a look at that and what that looks like. Our characteristics of comp uh, perfect competition look something like this. As far as the number of producers, perfectly competitive markets have a lot of producers and consumers. Okay? Um, having that large number of participants in that market helps promote competition. There are a lot of people making identical products. So when we talk about what's the similarity of the product in a perfectly competitive market, the product is exactly the same no matter who is producing it. So a lot of times we're talking about commodities. Um, any product that's exactly the same no matter who's making it, we refer to as a commodity. So examples of that would be um, mostly agricultural products. So think about like grains, cotton, sugar, crude oil, those would be things that we would look at in a, uh, as perfectly competitive. As far as um, entry into the market or ease of entry, um, in a perfectly competitive market structure, it's pretty easy entry. Uh, producers face very few restrictions in entering the market. That ease of entry is going to ensure that existing producers are going to face competition from new firms and that a single producer will not dominate the market. So if you wanted to get into this area, it's of, of production, it's relatively simple. There's not going to be a lot of barriers to entry, which we'll talk about more in a couple minutes. And then the last characteristic is control over prices. So um, in a perfectly competitive market, the producer has no market power. They can't influence prices because there's just too many other producers offering the exact same thing. So instead, the market forces of supply and demand are going to determine that price of that good. So it's really in that sense why we call it perfect competition. An economist, it's that perfect sense of competition, the, the market itself, the supply and demand is going to indicate that price. So let's look at a case study. Your book talks about onions as an opportunity or an example of perfect competition. So in order to get a better idea of how it works, um, let's think about the market for onions. So it's an agricultural product. Okay, if you think about it, um, the onion market is going to have many producers. Your book says that there's only over 500 growers of commercial onions in the United States. And they're all basically offering the same thing. An onion is an onion pretty much no matter where you go. There might be different types of onions, but again, the product itself is the same. Um, so onions from one farm are going to be pretty much the same as onions from any other farm. So that similarity of the product is there. It's an identical product. We've got the lots of producers. We've got the identical product. Um, furthermore, more, excuse me, uh, no farm is going to make enough onions to dominate the market. So 
there's no way to for it to become a monopoly um, and farmers become um, price takers. They have to accept the market price for their onions. They have to let um, demand indicate what their supply is going to be. So we've got many producers, an identical product, no control over prices, and easy entry into that market. So I mentioned earlier the idea of barriers to entry. So let's just take a second to kind of talk about what those barriers of entry um, could be. And these are things that could limit competition. So as we look at all the market, market structures, barriers to entry could impact any of them, not just this perfectly competitive market that we're looking at. So um, the idea of barriers to entry, uh, one possible barrier would be startup cost. If the initial expense of starting or launching a business costs too much, that could be a barrier to entry. So the book uh, gives the example of um, opening a bicycle repair shop. That's going to be a lot less expensive than opening a bicycle factory. So an entrepreneur that has very little financial capital might find it difficult to get into bicycle manufacturing because of the high cost of entry. Okay, so we would look at those startup costs as a possible barrier to entry. Okay, and that's what it's sort of talking about right here. The initial expense of launching a business. So startup costs is a barrier to entry. Another barrier to entry could be technology. So I'm trying to get our slide to adjust here a little bit. Uh, technology. The idea, um, if there is a need for specialized technology or training, that might also make it difficult to enter the market. The computer industry is a great example of that. So not only does the manufacturing of computers require advanced technology, it also requires very specialized knowledge that is going to take a lot of education or training in order to get that. So that could be a barrier to entry. Uh, the mining industry would be another example of a barrier to entry that we look at. We, we would refer to it as control of resources. So if an existing mining company already controls the best deposits of iron, copper, or some other mineral, it's going to be really hard for a new firm to come in and take over or be a competitor in that market. So we have to look at some of those things. When we're looking at that characteristic of um, ease of entry, you would be looking at these as factors. What are the startup costs? Uh, what is the control of resources? And what's the technology needed? So back to perfect competition for a second. Um, what are the benefits? Okay, what are the benefits of perfect competition? Um, like I mentioned earlier, perfect competition is rare in that purest form. Um, because it's the most efficient market structure, economists consider perfect competition to be sort of a benchmark or a standard to evaluate other markets. Um, but essentially, many markets are competitive enough to be nearly perfect. And we'll talk about that as we move on and talk about different market structures. But the bare, those nearly perfect markets are beneficial in a couple of ways. Number one, they're going to force producers to be as efficient as possible. When a producer can only sell at equilibrium price, the only way to maximize profit um, is to keep their production costs low. The second thing is because perfect competition is so efficient, consumers, that's a benefit to us. We should not have to pay more for a product than it's worth. The equilibrium price of that product in a perfectly competitive market should accurately reflect the value um, that's been placed on those productive resources. So to kind of go back and summarize, Oops, went too far. All right, look at, again, these com uh, perfect competition characteristics. We've got many producers and consumers. We have producers creating identical products. We have an ease to entry. It's easy to be a producer in this type of market structure. Um, the downside is, uh, is that those producers do not have any control over the prices that they set. Um, the market value is going to be based on quantity supplied versus quantity demand and find that perfect market equilibrium. All right, so hopefully you understand a little bit more about market structures. Remember that you are going to be looking at four different market structures. We just talked about the first. Uh, you've got three more ahead of you in this chapter. Thank you for listening and we'll talk to you next time.